Hello, everyone. This is Greg, your host of Goddamn GameCube. Welcome to Season 3. If you enjoy listening to our show, consider subscribing to us on YouTube for exclusive video content. Thank you and enjoy today's episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Goddamn GameCube. Greg and Beppy are your hosts today. And truly, I am honored and humbled to say that our guest today is Don Rawich. He is the co-creator of the iconic game Oregon Trail. Whether you love video games or have no interest in video games at all, you've probably played an iteration of Oregon Trail. Don, thank you so much for coming on. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining us. So let's start right at the beginning. Uh, you're an educator. Um, did you always want to be a teacher or um, what brought you down that career path? Well, I, I would say that um, I made a decision to become a teacher uh, when I was in college. But prior to that, um, I had so many good teachers uh, back in um, junior high school and high school uh, that I, I think that was a, a real influence on me um, uh, coming to the conclusion that uh, teaching um, would perhaps be my career. Gotcha. Um, so I was born in 1992 and I can't conceptualize like what a computer game was in 1971. Can you talk about how the idea of Oregon Trail came to you? Did it start as a tabletop game? And when did uh, Bill and Paul get involved in the uh, process? Okay, well, um, let's tell the story. Sure. First of all, I might say as a little bit of background that, that while I was in college and taking um, certain courses to prepare me uh, to be a social studies teacher, uh, I had the chance to look at some, uh, I guess what, what you're calling tabletop games or, or uh, box games that people had created uh, that, that had nothing to do with computers but uh, use paper and pencil and objects, uh, you know, kind of like Dungeons and Dragons, I guess. Yeah. Uh, to um, to try to simulate some things that happen uh, in in our social lives. So the idea of using games in the classroom stuck with me. It was later that I came to realize how computers could be um, utilized in the classroom. So. Um, uh, when, when it came time for me as a senior in college to, uh, to do what, what is normally called practice teaching or student teaching, it's where teaching candidates get a chance to work in a real school and take over classes for a supervising teacher. I started that out by observing what my supervisor did in the classroom. And then one day he came to me and said, now I want you to uh, get prepared because in a couple of weeks, we're going to start a unit on the westward movement in the United States. And um, I want you to take that unit and teach it to my classes um, instead of just being an observer. So I, I thought to myself, well, that, uh, that will be fun, I think. But um, I, I also had noticed that typically in, in the classes that I sat, sat at and observed, uh, the textbook was by far the, the one resource that teachers relied on. And I figured that, I mean, if you know anything about 14-year-old uh, eighth graders, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know that they, they don't just sit still and, and say, here, uh, oh, okay, I'm going to read this book, even though I have no interest whatsoever in what it's all about. Um, so uh, the idea of the box games came back to me. And I thought, well, maybe I could create a box game about this uh, migration across the, the U.S. territory. Uh, so I, I created a, a very large map of the Oregon Trail and the Western United States and uh, laid it out on the floor and started thinking about uh, getting uh, markers for the, the players and, uh, I don't know, maybe little covered wagons, who knows, um, and then also perhaps utilizing the rolling of dice or the uh, the flipping of cards over to determine what happens to you at various points along the way. And so uh, after I got that set up, my 
my two colleagues, uh, Paul Dillenberger and Bill Heineman, uh, we were all living in the same apartment and they came home one afternoon and they saw this map on the floor and so forth. And they, they asked, well, what are you doing? And I explained, I'm, I'm going to try to gonna try to make a game out of the, the, the 2000 mile trip west. And they and that's when they said, uh, well, that sounds like a great idea. That's very innovative. But, you know, if we could deliver this on a computer, it would be way more interesting. Now, they had had some computing experience. Uh, they were both math teachers, but um, I had not. So, you know, I said, oh, OK, <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> but I didn't really, really know how you would do that. So that that led then to the the, the three of us working on this game for a few weeks, uh, you know, a version 1.0 that we could use on the computer system that my school uh, had access to. Now, was this first version, uh, was this text based? I Graphics were not brought in until later. Is that right? Yes, uh, that's correct. In in the uh, <laughs> long ago days, in the early 70s, uh, there were no such things as personal computers. So if you wanted to use a computer, you had to use a, a giant computer. Often uh, the computers that uh, you would find at, at a university uh, campus. Mm -hmm. And um, fortunately, the Minneapolis Public Schools was kind of a, um, uh, a leader, a pioneer, if, if I may say that, uh, <laughs> in uh, bringing computers um, into the classroom. And uh, the way that that worked was there was a large computer in the, the school district central office, and the schools could access it by utilizing a teletype machine, which, which was connected to the computer via a telephone line. Wow. And so that's, uh, you know, that, that goes back quite a ways. But what you'd put in, it would type out, and then what the computer came back with, it would type out. And all of this would be printed on a, um, a, a large roll of paper, you know, like, the, like a, a, a roll of um, paper towels that you might find in the sure. kitchen. Um, so that's, that's how it was done. And even though I'm saying to you that the school I was in had access to computing, at that time, because of uh, budgetary limitations, the schools in Minneapolis, uh, at least the, the middle schools and perhaps elementary schools, each one of them only had one teletype. Wow. So I made sure to reserve the teletype in my school for the week that I was going to use the game. I, to, to sort of piggyback on what Greg was saying, um, the game changed significantly uh, over time. Uh, there were many different versions. I guess we wanted to ask you, um, how involved were you in the different versions as, as it iterated over time? Well, um, I guess uh, up until about 1979 or so, um, I, I was the, the expert on the game since mm -hmm. I had been part of inventing it. And, uh, and I had done um, research uh, a after we used it as, as student teachers. I, I then went and did further research so that we could set up the algorithms in the game to uh, create results that that were um, to a degree accurate in what really happened historically. Um, but when the personal computers came out, starting uh, in the state of Minnesota with the Apple II, that's when uh, I, I no longer had expertise. And so the place that I was working at um, and that that was responsible for uh, providing computer access to, to the schools in Minnesota, uh, uh, we set up a, a different team of people to convert some of the programs we'd been offering on the large computer so that now they could be on a diskette and, and uh, put up on a personal computer. And then uh, we also started making new games to run on those machines. Um, I did want to ask also in that same kind of time period, um, how did Oregon Trail go national? Um, did it? Uh, did you kind of oversee it as it intertwined with consumer software being a bigger thing? Was it that around that time? Um, let's see, it's, it's a little more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. But um, have we brought up 
the place I was working, the Minnesota Educational Computing uh, Consortium. Ah, I did not know you worked there. Okay, okay, go ahead. As as uh, the 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 time went on, we in the in the latter seventies we began to see that there was going to be a big change in computing because we started to see coming on the market the personal computer. Um, the uh, Radio Shack had one, Commodore had one, Apple had one, and several other companies that uh, <laughs> died in the process um, also ha were trying to uh, bring these small computers that you could own for yourself, bring them into their homes. Up until then, there, there really was no such thing as a software market because the, the, the there were the computers were all so big, there, there was a relatively small number of them in schools. Such a commodity, yeah. Yeah. Whereas when, say, the Apple II came out, now suddenly schools had dozens of computers. Right. Um, we, uh, we converted some of our programs, we created new programs, we stored them on floppy disks, and we gave the disks to the, the schools of Minnesota at no charge. Because okay, wow. we, we were a state organization. That's awesome. But one day, I, now I'm going to make this part up, but one sure. day, <laughs> some, somebody who lived in Iowa must have come across the border to a Minnesota school and seen all this software that they had <laughs> and and called us up and said, well, how can we get a hold of this stuff? <laughs> right. Uh, because we're, we're bringing in computers just like the Minnesota schools are, but we hardly have any software, educational software that we could sure. use. And now we find out that uh, that you guys have been have been developing program after program uh, to uh, be used with students. So at that point, a light bulb went on, and we realized that we could charge the other forty nine states for our <laughs> software mm -hmm. and continue to provide it free for Minnesota. So that started to turn us into a a sales based company. Got it. Um, the next question I had for you, um, how, I guess we'll start at that time. How did Oregon Trail change your public and, per, and professional life, maybe starting at that period of time? Well, I gained a reputation uh, and my two colleagues um, also uh, became uh, somewhat well known about the game, but they were, they were working, uh, well, Paul was ended up working in a school as his career. Bill decided after a year or so of teaching that he really was more suited for becoming a software engineer. And so he went to work for a company that did that. Uh, let's see. So uh, the, the reputation was, was something that was kind of nice because when you went to conferences and so on and people came to know what, what you were known for, mm -hmm. um, that uh, there were opportunities. And that, for me, um, that resulted in um, more than a few speaking engagements at sure. various uh, school conferences around the country. But uh, I'll, I'll just add this this one comment. I'm not sure if you're aware of it, but even though we we had developed reputations, um, we were not earning any money from the okay. uh, from the invention because. Um, the, the Oregon Trail was uh, improved and marketed by the MEC organization. Okay. And if, if you don't have the resources that, that, that we had at MEC, you wouldn't as an individual be able to um, make any headway um, in the marketplace that was emerging. Um, now, are you still involved with Oregon Trail in any capacity? If And if not, when did that end? Well, I worked at MEC from 1974 to 1990. At that time then, I, uh, I took a, a position in another uh, educational technology company. But for, for the most part, again, when the personal computers came on, we had um, people at MEC who had the more direct expertise in that. So one of MEC's uh, missions was to um, uh, orient the uh, the teachers in Minnesota schools as to how, how do you work these things and how can you use them in the classroom and how can they be used as a teaching tool. Um, so that, that was uh, something I was very interested in and um, I did not have the background to uh, write programs. Um, yeah, I... I uh... <laughs> 
kind of on the heels of that, uh, Oregon Trail has reached tens of millions of students over the course of decades. How does it feel knowing that you created arguably one of the most popular video games ever made? You must feel like a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I could tell you uh, for the next hour or so um, anecdotes about coming across people who didn't know who I was, but but who remembered vividly their Oregon Trail experience in schools. Mm -hmm. and when they found out um, who I was or, or what I had been a part of, um, they they got very excited. Um, I, I signed more than a few autographs. Wow, uh, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> right on. <laughs> but um, uh, the, the three of us, uh, I think, are, are united in our uh, conceptualization of, of what what all of this brought about um, because we we started this out at a time when there was no marketplace. Uh, we were all teachers at the time, and uh, when you're when you're looking at making a career of that, one of the things that you tend to believe in is that we need to share as much learning material as we can among among teachers, among the people in the schools. Uh, we're, we're not out to make money from, from each other. Uh, we're, we're trying to find better ways to uh, educate kids. And so we feel that the invention of the Oregon Trail certainly helped to do that. That, that was um, one, of the, one of the things uh, that was nice about um, having been a part of this. And uh, however, we, we never back in the 70s, we had no idea whatsoever that this was going to take off sure. uh, like it did. Um, and I might also add that one of the things that the three of us are, are pretty proud of is that we had no precedence to learn from to figure out how to make an Oregon Trail game. Right. You know, there were no college courses. There were no sure. books about it. <laughs> there were no conferences. And so we just did kind of followed our teaching instincts and with uh, with some some knowledge among the three of us of how to how to turn that into code. Uh, we, we created this game, um, which I think has been a, I, I think is recognized as as one of the first, if not the first serious um, educational computing game simulations that were uh, invented. Beppy, before you take the next one, I just want to say, uh, Don, what you just said is like amazing to me. Like the, the way you articulated that, you know, the scenarios in the game and the different, you know, uh, the path through the Oregon Trail and the different scenarios you know, the characters can get into and the dice rolls. It's what I think what's impressed me is just it's just I can't even articulate it how during that time period you took these dice rolls and box and tabletop games and put it into computing and that and those concepts are are the foundation of hundreds of video games and and RPGs and adventure games today. It seems like they're rooted in that. So, I mean, I wasn't even going to ask a question. I think I'm just saying thank you. It's just I, a compliment. <laughs> it's just a compliment. <laughs> but Beppy, I, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I was just going to say Thinking, thinking back to that time when I was asking Greg uh, off mic, you know, when was the last time that you really seriously played? He's like, must have been back when I was a kid. And I was like, thinking about back then, you had no kind of idea that what you were experiencing was such a bleeding edge kind of phenomenon software wise, like really incredible. Um, but I did want to uh, sort of branch off in that direction with, um, I wondered if you had much to say about games and education and how important um, interaction or play is in learning. Well, I, I think it can be um, very valuable. Um, and one of the things that strikes me is that, um, well, we, we, have a, we have the term video games and, and that, that typically is, is not used for educational software. It, it brings to mind um, um, shooter games and uh, other things like that. But it's a, a lot of those games are one dimensional in, in my mind, which is that you your your purpose in playing is to figure out a strategy that will help you win. And I'm not saying that that's that's not cool stuff because you've got to use logic and, and brain power and so forth. But um, but that that's kind of the main purpose. Um, and then there are educational software products 
that um, that are uh, strictly uh, strictly contain content. So okay, uh, I've turned on the uh, this this new program and I see ten multiplication problems on the screen, and I need to type in the answers to each of them. Well, that can have some value, I guess, to a school or to to students. But um, again, it's it's kind of one dimensional. It's it's just kind of dealing with the with content for the sake of uh, uh, being able to work with the content, but not you know not necessarily um, involving the player, getting the, the the player involved in a way that helps them to understand um, how how the stuff works. But one thing I've always felt about uh, Oregon Trail is that I think it's a multi-dimensional product. So for example, um, the first thing that, that people concentrate on, I think when they play it is, um, I've got to find out how to get to Oregon. And uh, when when a group of uh, like teachers in a workshop first tried out Oregon Trail, maybe half of them died uh, along <laughs> the way. But in, in real Damn. life, uh, I don't know what the percentage was, but a significant number of people died traveling that trail because it was difficult. It was hard to figure out. Um, so that that's one one way that it it uh, contributes to learning. And then there's there's a content piece to it, right? You learn something about history, something about geography, something about uh, budgeting your 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 money and your resources. And then there's a third dimension, which um, which has always kind of fascinated me. Uh, and that is that um, when I first uh, worked with my class way, way back 50 years ago, um, I noticed that, well, first of all, I decided to uh, break the class into small groups because there was no way we could have each student play the entire game, like 30 students doing that um, in, the, in the week that I had to, to use this. And so um, I, I put them in small groups of like five students in a group and had them play it as if they were a family, a pioneer family. Uh, each day, one of the small groups got to be on the computer for the whole period and the others did other things I gave them, make maps of the trail, uh, read stories about uh, the, the pioneer days and, and mm -hmm. so forth. And I found it interesting that the small group of, of students that would be playing the game uh, on a given day start, started to um, come up with some rather sophisticated thinking. So for example, when you play that game, you have to make decisions right and left. And the first thing that would happen with, with someone taking it on for the first time is, well, I, one person, I want to do this. The other person says, no, no, we got to cross the river. No, <laughs> got to go hunting. And, they, they began to realize that if they kept arguing with every decision, they wouldn't have enough time left in the period to complete the, the program. So they invented voting. Ha, okay. <laughs> and they said, well, why don't we vote on these uh, decisions that we have to make? And we'll, you know, uh, majority rules and we'll, we'll just do that. We'll appoint someone to count the votes each time. And that, that's how we're going to move this thing along without uh, arguing with each other. Then uh, another interesting thing happened uh, when that first version of the game um, did allow you to hunt along the trail, but uh, you, didn't, you didn't see or have a gun. Uh, you had a mechanism where the computer, you would say, I want to go hunting. And the computer would come back and say, type bang. Uh -huh, okay. <laughs> All right. And if you... <laughs> The faster you type bang, the, the more food you could potentially gather. Uh, and But you also had to spell it correctly. No typos allowed. <laughs> Otherwise, you don't, uh, you don't get the food. So at the beginning, when that kind of thing happened on the, on the teletype, all the hands from five kids raced to the keyboard and tried to type in bang or wham or pow, or we, we had a, a little collection of, uh, of gun noises. Mm -hmm. um, and so they realized that if, if they kept kind of getting in each other's way, that they were gonna fail uh, in their attempts to hunt mm -hmm. food, for example. So um, what happened was they, you, you could watch them. They'd say, you know what, Sue over there, she is the best typist in our group here. 
So everybody get out of the way, put her in the chair at the keyboard. <laughs> and when the, when the, the shooting thing comes up, she's going to type it in fast and accurate. And that's, they, they invented this division of labor concept on their own. <laughs> wow. So I, I, what I take pride in about, about the, the product is how rich it is in, in learning opportunities of different types. Wow. Um, so branching off of that, uh, personally, I feel as though games like Pokemon and Legend of Zelda greatly influenced my education. Um, as a child, those games helped me to read because there was no voice acting and I had to be a better reader to understand those games. In a way, they forced me to be a better reader, but those games are not intentionally educational. That being said, like what educational value do you see in a video game? You know, video games that differ from educational software. Well, I, I think I, I think in a, if a game is helping the student to recognize a problem and then um, work on a solution to the problem, that 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 is a, a worthwhile activity. But as I was just saying a few minutes ago, if if the entire purpose of the game is to figure out a strategy or get all the content questions correct, mm -hmm. uh, then I, I I don't think that that's um, it, it may be it may be uh, touted as educational software, but in, in my mind, not challenging enough. Sure. Got it. Now, uh, we're going to continue on that path and we're going to get a little bit cultural here. Um, there is a lot of conflicting and confusing information in the world about video games and their uh, perceived value. Um, terms like video games will, will rot your brain is something I hear a lot from parents. Can you comment on that? And after all, I mean this in, you know, in a in a serious but joking way, you know, after all, you are an educator who created, you know, a, a, a video game in a sense. So do you have any comments on that? Like culturally, you know, stuff like video games will rot your brain and so on. <laughs> well, um, when when I worked at Mac, I had occasion to to view um, uh, products that other companies were were coming out with. And some of them were ingenious and some of them were, at least in my mind, kind of boring. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I, I think that the, people get attached to certain words. And when you say games and you're in a school, uh, you get a lot of pushback because okay. well, you don't want our kids just playing around. Although right. <laughs> if you were to ask me, maybe you did earlier, what, what do I think about using play in learning, I would say, well, yes, that, that can be valuable. But um, uh, I, I never, I don't know, I, I never really conceived of Oregon Trail as a game, okay. uh, as, as the term is often used. Um, I like to call it a historical simulation, but, um, okay. but if I said that phrase to too many people, <laughs> they would probably turn me away. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah. but that's that's what we were doing. We were simulating a historical experience and uh, trying to do it in a way that would stick with the with the kids. And as a matter of fact, I have at, at conferences run into lots of people who've come up and said, yeah, I played Oregon Trail in my uh, you know junior high classroom. And it, it was the only thing we did with the computer where I learned anything. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> wow. You know, so I'm saying, well, that, that kind of <laughs> supports my observation. So again, I, th I think it's, uh, it, it's the multidimensional um, learning that can, can take place from something that you create with the technology um, that is the, the most important thing that really yeah. gets students um yeah you know using their brains i um i think we you know this comes up a couple times on our show about like how games can be used as teaching tools or how they teach you things how they kind of test your memory and whatnot and you know i, I think there are some games that probably rot your brain but you know maybe <laughs> not all of them <laughs> but um yeah no i i guess just kind of um we're getting towards the end i just wanted to um ask you you know i know I know Oregon Trail is a simulation, but do you um, can you comment at all about 
did you sort of predict the way that I guess games or simulations or software um, would grow in the various ways they have? Um, did anything in particular surprise you about their changing like role in culture or anything? Well, I probably the first thing that I would say is that um, we we kind of got during the seventies we we got comfortable with um, the use of the mainframe computer and what it could do, but there were no there were no graphics and. <laughs> Uh, other things, animations, and so forth that were, were soon to come. But um, once those personal computers arrived in the marketplace, uh, starting with the the early '80s, uh, it I found it impossible to try to predict, you know, what what the next thing was going to be um, you, using uh, th those technologies because uh, it was just it was just something in, entirely new. It, you know, we couldn't predict, and it seemed like every year there were not only new computer models, but there there were new um, innovations in in software and applications for for schools and so on. Uh, and it's um, it, and ever since then, I think it's been um, it it's continued to grow at a pretty rapid pace. Yeah, exponentially. I'm, yeah. I'm sure if I walked into a classroom today. Um, I would be um, somewhat at a loss for w what the students were supposed to do with the laptops that uh, <laughs> they hand out yeah. as they come in the classroom. Yeah. Um, because it, unless unless you do it on a daily basis, it's pretty hard to keep up. Um, and so our last uh, big picture question before we get to the fun round that we always have. Um, Don, where do you see educational technology going in the future or what would you like to see? Well, one thing that I've noticed um, for, for all the attention that we try to pay towards how computers can help instruction uh, and, and learning with kids is that schools are also buying a fair amount of software products that, that have nothing to do with um, teaching and learning. Uh, they keep track of your test scores and they uh, the schedule your lunchrooms and uh, you, you can set up your um, uh, your school bus uh, timelines and so forth, um, and and I'm uh, computers, of course, are helping all kinds of of industries. There's no question about it. Um, but some sometimes I kind of fear a little bit that um, that schools will will start to um, spend more of their funding on the things that make the administration of the school more efficient, okay. but not necessarily um, uh, help students learn. Wow. Um, okay. <laughs> so at the end of all of our interviews, we always do a little rapid fire fun round. Um, so we've come to the end, so uh, let's get to it. Uh, so rapid fire number one, uh, Don, uh, th what is the most trouble you got into in school as a kid? I never got into any trouble at school because <laughs> I feared for my life. Uh, <laughs> really, I was, nothing. I was, uh, I was, um, I was one of those students who, who always wanted to do what you were supposed to, and uh, you know what the teacher had assigned you to do. Uh, let's see. I do remember though, um, in in one of the elementary grades, um, some of us got the idea that if you take a crayon. Yeah. And you hold it in your hand for a while, and your hand is warm. The crayon starts to get soft and, mm -hmm. and pliable, and so we used to um, shape them into uh, cubes and use a toothpick to put the the dots of the dice on, and then use them to roll dice in the back of the room when no one. Oh was wow! Uh, it's really creative. <laughs> but uh, we, we never got caught, so I, I don't I don't count that as trouble that I got into. No, I think you're you got a clean slate. <laughs> yeah, the joke I was gonna make: if you do what teachers tell you, if a teacher told you to ford the river, would you do it? <laughs> um, oh boy. So um, the, the next rapid fire question is, what was your favorite subject in school as a kid? Math. Mathematics. I really, I really loved mathematics and probably because it was such an organized um, subject area. Sure. Uh, and, and I actually thought as I was about to leave high school that when I got to college, I was probably going to be a math major. Um, but when I got there, I found that the, um, the conceptual level of the content 
in college level mathematics was um, out of my league. So <laughs> Me I, too. Uh, I decided, uh, yeah, decided uh, that um, history, which is another thing that kind of fascinated me, uh, would be where I would um, put my emphasis. Um, do you have a favorite video game or tabletop game or as you call them, boxed games? Um, I, I don't uh, I haven't played video games very often. Um, although I, I used to be a, a Pac-Man aficionado, mm. but, um, tabletop games, uh, there are two that I, that I really enjoy. Um, the older one of the two is called acquire, uh, okay. you build, um, conglomerations of hotels and you, uh, build up your money supply and you, you try to try to be the best uh, business person in the room. Uh, it's it's very cleverly um, designed and something that I I think is cool. The other one is Ticket to Ride mm. because I'm a train nut. Um, <laughs> just just being able to handle all those little cars is pretty cool. Um, Trains are awesome, yeah. But, yeah, <laughs> but the, but the you know the kind of the scheduling and rerouting of trains and so forth I, I find fascinating. Got that that math part of your brain working again. <laughs> okay. Well, we kind of well you kind of already answered it, but hey, it, let's let's just go for it. Go ahead, go um, ahead, Beppy. Have you uh, <laughs> have you seen any T-shirts that say you have died of dysentery? I have one. Too. <laughs> you have one. Yeah. Wow, an old one. <laughs> who, uh, who am I kidding? <laughs> I see the the poster behind you as well. So you still uh, still a big part of your life, I guess. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. Well, it, can you really see that? Because there's a glare off the. I, all I can make out is Oregon Trail, but uh, okay, well, I see like the little graphic. And there was a book put out in Minnesota a few years ago, which um, gave information on all of the um, innovations that had come out of Minnesota, the inventions and so forth. Mm -hmm. And they put Oregon Trail right in that book. And oh, wow. behind me is a kind of a, a blow up of the, the, the page of the Oregon Trail uh, section. That's awesome. Wow. That's going to feel great. <laughs> um, however, let's get back to dysentery. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Lightning rounds. <laughs> The version of the game that the three of us created in the 70s did not mention dys dysentery. It, it certainly had people, you know, dying of disease, but sure. Okay. But when the, the mech team that converted uh, the program to the Apple II uh, got done with their work, they, so one of them had decided that you have died of dysentery uh, was, was something that should be put into the program. And um, it's always been irritating to me, frankly. <laughs> wow, that's like an unbelievable that's... bit of information. <laughs> really, uh, it's well, like they... it's like the Luke, I am your father thing. It's like hearing it completely wrong. You know? <laughs> no, they, you, I mean, are you opposed to like comedy in the game, or is it like you know? No, just no, kind of... I no, I think that there that you can do clever things, sure. um, but uh, to to kind of make a slogan out of a deadly disease. I think. <laughs> It's yeah, kind of, it's a kind of rub me the wrong tasteless. way. <laughs> yeah, um, but yes, there are there are T-shirts and other things about the Oregon Trail um, that I don't know. We'll probably keep it fresh for a while. <laughs> um, Don, thank you so much for uh, being with us. We have come to the end. Thank you so much for your contributions to um, to education, to games, to historical simulators, and uh, and and um, all of those products. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, it was a pleasure. I enjoyed the conversation. Thank you so much.